most video game bosses tend to be more corporeal with their threats. Not these ones. These are the ones that mess with your grasp of reality. They mess with your perceptions. They make you question what is real. They wear you down, not with damage to the body, but to the mind. And often the body by proxy. To place high on this list, a candidate must wield illusions to make the player question their grasp on reality, be as mentally distressing to the player as they are to their character. Oh yes, this is not just which ones can break the fourth wall. That can help, but it's all in the method. Space primarily relies on horrific imagery and sound to deliver its nightmare fuel directly into your veins. But that's not to say it can't be just as effective when it comes to a psychological angle. If you want an example of that, take a look at the story of Nicole Brennan. Prior to the game's events, Nicole was a medical officer and a love interest to the main character, Isaac Clark. She was an ideal operative, saving as many lives as possible until she ended her own. Rather, understandably, Isaac is haunted by the whole ordeal and blames himself for it. Gee, I sure hope that doesn't result in him suffering from hallucination. <laughs> Sir, this is the scariest moment of my life. As things go on, however, Nicole begins to take a different tone. She goes from a horrific vision to something resembling a benevolent spirit. She guides Isaac to the marker so he can destroy it once and for all. And what do you know? It's a trap! Inside Isaac's own mind, he must destroy the marker's final influence. The visuals are just great here. I mean, look at this. Yow! Unfortunately, the actual boss fight itself has the exact same problem as the hive mind from the previous game. Despite the excellent buildup, it's pathetically easy. In fact, it's arguably worse here. There's only one glowing weak spot to shoot. Still, the story's relevance and usage of psychological horror earned it a place on this list. You know, between the Dead Space remake and the latest Star Wars games, EA's been less horrible these days. Somehow I don't think that'll apply to the next Dragon Age. In Metal Gear Solid 3, the main antagonists you face off against are the Cobra unit. Six elite soldiers, each with their own style of combat. These range from sniping, pyromania, predator-esque stealth, hornet bending, or CQC. By far the most unique one is the Sorrow. Oh yeah, this guy takes a completely different approach to combat than his contemporaries. Rather than kill him, you have to survive. You can't even damage him as he has zero health. The only way to win is to slowly trudge through an entire river while avoiding everything he throws at you. Good luck trying to do that when the ghosts of literally everyone you've killed throughout the game will come back to haunt you. Or you could just cheese it by dying on purpose and then taking the pill. Post out like a Yeesh. But then you won't get the really good camo upgrade. This being Metal Gear, there's more than one tactic to succeed. The ghosts that appear are only of enemies that you personally killed. If you went purely for stealth, you could just casually stroll to the end. If it wasn't obvious enough, the sorrow is revealed to have been a ghost the whole time. His goal wasn't to get in Snake's way, but to help him understand the ramifications of his actions. He even reappears in 4 to help a screaming mantis. You know, for a guy named the sorrow, he's surprisingly helpful. Illusions come in many flavors, but some of the most well-known are those coming from our own unconscious psyche. We've all had weird dreams that make zero sense before, but once they turn into nightmares, they could be harrowing expressions of our darkest fears. 
And our number eight here weaponizes that. The Mario and Luigi series is well known by now for having some of the most standout villains the Mushroom Kingdom's ever seen. But today we're focusing on a particular batty lad, Antasma the Bat King. Uh, uh, uh. Antasma makes his presence known right away, jumping our portly plumber as a surprise tutorial boss in a sudden nightmare sequence before the bros even make it to Pillow Island. And once you do make it there, Antasma proves to be quite the adversary. Once a regular bat in the ancient Pillow civilization, Antasma gorged himself on dreams and nightmares, eventually powering himself up with the Dark Stone, an all-powerful wish-granting artifact powered by the nightmares of the world. Causing a near apocalypse for the Pillow people, Antasma was sealed in a last-ditch effort deep inside the dream world, with Antasma's last act to crush the Dark Stone and curse the Pillow into petrified stone forms. So... Of course, Antasma manages to break his seal and begin terrorizing the bros just as they arrive for their vacation. Man, first Delfino, now this. Mario's got horrible luck with picking his vacation spots, doesn't he? Antasma manages to be quite the thorn in our hero's side, teaming up with Bowser and being quite the fun villain. He's a discount Dracula, but with a dream flare. That's always fun to see. When we finally meet him face to face at a surprise twist of fate, it's Bowser who portrays the RPG villain this time around. So Antasma decides to throw down with Mario and Luigi, sucking them into the dream world and fighting them on his own turf. And if you thought he was just a simple vampire, boy, you'd be mistaken. Antasma's got tricks like you wouldn't believe. His mastery over the dream world is absolute, bursting out clones like it's going out of style, ghastly fire attacks, unbreakable shields, and the humorously named Antas Munchies, who serve as minion spiky weapons and a convenient healing snack. Ugh. He can even separate Luigi's superpowered dream self from Mario and seal him inside one of them, leaving Mario woefully depowered against him. But Antasma's scariest trick is what happens if Mario's unfortunate enough to fall victim to his nightmares. Every now and then, Antasma can hit you with a debuff that puts you to sleep. Already inside a nightmare. And here, all Mario can do is run from Antasma, hopefully trying to escape the demonic dream dump here and avoiding sawblade filled death traps that are just as deadly as the real thing. I thought it wasn't real. Your mind makes it real. Just think about this for a second. Having a nightmare, inside a nightmare, scary enough to deal real damage to you, real enough that the nightmare can hurt you. Physically. Conceptually, this is horrific. Look up. Messed up combination of Freddy Krueger and Inception. When you poop in your dreams, you poop for real. Antasma earns his spot on this list here for that attack alone. His fight's surprisingly tricky though, yeah, and doesn't really abuse his illusionary skills as much as he could. Still, Antasma's fight is definitely one of the highlights of Dream Team and the RPGs as a whole. Nintendo games really have a knack for having cool dream demons, don't they? You think Antasma and Darkrai are drinking buddies? Remember that quiet, ugly duckling that likes to read in the corner? He grew up. Zexion was the most mysterious, least interesting of the organization members for a while. He taunted Riku and Chain of Memories for a bit, but he was killed shortly after by Riku Replica. He didn't even have a boss fight until Rechain. But when he got that glow up in Rechain, it was glorious. Zexion taunts you with dialogue from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX because Recom is a card game anime and Riku pulls out his red eyes darkness dragon to beat up Zexion's blue eyes shining dragon. I don't know what any of that means. Zexion will attack you with his different lexicons, summoning cyclones, and eventually clones to keep you astray. Targeting the correct Zexion will help you keep up the pressure and kill him quickly, which you will do. You got permanent dark form in this fight and with how broken card breaks are, it's actually pretty hard to lose this fight. Still very satisfied to beat his head in his Riku. His cage 2 fight ups the ante by forcing you to find the correct lexicon, get out of his magic traps, and play red light, blue light. Yeah, I don't get it either. This fight is much harder, but also more gimmicky and not one you can beat quickly. They both have their ups and downs, so I guess pick which one you like. I personally prefer the Chain of Memories fight, but I will also stand that game to death, don't at me bro. I'll admit that Zexion's illusions aren't as amazing as later fights, but it still shows the range he has as the organization's mage. He was able to trick Riku, put pressure on Sora, and eventually became a great ally to both of them in KH3. Wonder if we'll see him again. I know the fangirls want him bad.
It's no secret that many works of modern-day supernatural psychological horror owe their roots to H.P. Lovecraft. Even today, everyone loves Cthulhu. The people love me. What can I say? It's not odd that this influence extends to video games. One video game in particular has gained widespread notoriety and acclaim. I am, of course, talking about Day of the Tentacle. <laughs> Just kidding, it's Bloodborne. Bloodborne is all about having these strange dreams. Like, is any of this real or not? There's talk of dreams and nightmares, and great ones, and you're not sure if you can trust your lying eyes. There is one boss in Bloodborne that exemplifies this conundrum to a T. I speak of the Witches of Hemwick. Wait, wait! Yeah, yeah. It's rough to like something the majority of the fan base hates, but on this one, I'm sticking to my guns, mostly because they are the only boss in the game that directly interacts with the insight mechanic. The more insight you collect, the more you see things as they really are, supposedly. Or maybe it's simply an illusion designed to drive you to madness. After all, the more insight you have, the more vulnerable you are to frenzy status. Hmm. The witches are widely considered to be an easier boss fight, but I don't mind that so much. Mostly because the witches are a thinking boss. The puzzle of how to cut through their illusions is something I enjoy. I'd argue the whole point of Souls Likes is to figure out a boss and adapt and overcome. If you personally can't figure out the puzzle and dislike the boss because of it, well, get good. Whatever the truth of the matter, if there even is one. The witch's spawn adds depending on if you have insight or not. Even a single point of insight allows the witches to summon the mad ones to their aid. But maybe the mad ones aren't there at all. A figment of your imagination pulled forth by the witches. Or perhaps they were always there and your ignorance allowed you to ignore them. Out of sight, out of mind after all. Now, it's impossible to fight the witches with no insight on your first try. Even gazing upon the witches is enough to impart your feeble mind with a single point of insight. However, should you die or otherwise leave the boss arena, you can spend your insight and re-challenge the witches of Hemwick in blissful ignorance. Cut down the old crones and you move one step closer to... something. And by God, fear the old blood. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? It's where you talk about an awesome video game villain and think you can pull off his accent. For all the limited screen time he got in Far Cry 3, Voss demonstrated what made him a legitimate threat. He's cunning, charismatic, unhinged, and unpredictable. Even when his appearances were minimal, he commanded a terrifying presence. Ultimately, it all comes to a head where we finally decide to confront and kill the psycho pirate. We think we're getting the jump on him, but surprise, he gets us first. He stabs us with a knife and... Whoa, mama. I am tripping every single ball that I have. The world becomes a distorted, trippy nightmare as we find ourselves following the glowy brick road where everything is dark, smoky, glitchy, and... I didn't need to see that. As we journey through the actual insanity, we find ourselves shooting down a whole plethora of Vosses running towards us with blades drawn before we finally reach the real Voss. Or about as real as a trippy sequence is gonna get. You get your chance to do a little knife swinging at him. He blocks you, but with a little maneuvering, congrats! You managed to out Voss Voss. Kinda. Yeah, Voss's fate is kinda up in the air by the end of the game, only really answered by Far Cry 6's DLC. But even that's up in the air because the whole thing is a metaphorical drug dream. Maybe even an actual one, you know, depending on what was in that knife. Between the trippy as hell visuals, Voss's insane screamings, and... <laughs> Moving past that, I love how symbolic the whole fight is. It feels like you're getting an insight into Voss's twisted brain as you venture forth to take him out. In fact, that Far Cry 6 DLC I mentioned basically confirmed that this is how Voss perceives the world. Looking at these games back to back really makes you wonder who's the real insane one here. The real answer, Citra for her really icky means to turn these guys into her personal puppets. Ah. There's a big difference between illusion and delusion. 
An illusion is a scene that is put before you that isn't real or tries to trick you. A delusion is a mindset that you believe something that is usually wrong and you will go to unbelievable lengths to make it become true. An illusion is fighting an alien on top of a corporate energy company. The delusion is thinking you're the son of said alien when your daddy is Hojo. Like, come on, Seffy, you really think you get your looks from those two? We were under the delusion that the Final Fantasy VII remake wasn't going to be good, but man was I happy to be wrong as both games are killing it! The boss fights in both of these games are insane, and when it comes to the remake specifically, Genova Dreamweaver tops that chart. After going through the insane Chapter 17 and seeing Barrett seemingly die, Genova pops in her head to scare the crap out of our heroes. Like most remake fights, this battle is in stages. The first stage sees you just avoiding her attacks and killing her tentacles so you can hit the main body. She will use powerful magic AoEs to keep you on your toes and away from her. Once phase two pops in, she will summon a bunch of tentacles and make herself immortal until you kill them all. The tentacles will keep spawning, so you gotta keep killing until they're all gone. A subdued but dramatic version of Genova's theme plays during these two phases, showing the madness is just warming up. When phase three hits, the main Genova theme plays and it is glorious. Genova starts raining down acid from above and will transport around as you chase it and finish it off. Despite the graphicness of it all, this was just an illusion created by Genova. Even in her bio, it says she's shown to create hallucinations, which I guess is different from a delusion and an illusion, but uh, th okay, the boss fight's cool, okay? I haven't had a chance to get into Rebirth yet, but if the Genova fight's there as cool as this one, okay, I'm a little excited. Plus, I'm just excited to dunk on Genova and Sefi with Kate Sith. Martin Lee, aka Mr. Negative. Another relatively newer baddie in Spider-Man's rogues gallery, this once philanthropist became negative in every sense of the word. From his negative film palette to his ability to control people with their negative emotions. His story in the comics is tragic as heck, but he hasn't really gotten a chance to shine in other media outlets. But then, everything changed when Insomniac took a crack at it. When the 2018 Spidey game came around, oh mama did Marty get the shine. He became the second biggest villain of the story right beside Doc Ock. Posing as Peter's second hero and a philanthropist, he leads the Inner Demons Gang and joins Ox Sinister Six in a massive terrorist plot to get revenge on Norman Osborn. Turns out our Green Goblin in the making had a hand in causing Martin's condition, which also got his parents killed. So that's, uh, how many lives Norman's ruined? Probably much more considering all the people these guys killed because of him. Remember kids, Whenever anything goes wrong in the Spidey games, it's most likely Osborne's fault. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if he caused Insomniac's leak in December. Anyways, we're here for the illusions. We have three major encounters with Lee, two of which involve him trying to warp Spidey's brain. The first encounter is more focused on fighting his shadowy minions, but in the third encounter, the main storyline's penultimate boss fight, Lee himself gets in on the action. Like the first encounter, the world is converted into a monochrome nightmare. Lee himself acting as the primary source of light, ironically. His angry, berating voice echoes through your mind as you chase him through a seemingly never-ending maze. You find yourself in the real world again as you finally catch him, and the battle begins. You have to dodge slice after slice from his blade before you can look for an opening and beat him down. All the while you beg for him to stop, but... He's not backing down yet. Instead, he drags us back into his nega world, sicking his shadowy minions on us and conjuring an enormous monster illusion to try and take a swipe at us. Once again, keep on your toes, dodge as much as you can before finding another opening to literally knock him back to reality. Not only is the fight a visual spectacle, but it's pretty freaking harrowing, keeping us on our toes and really reflecting how deep in Peter's psyche Martin got. Speaking of Peter, notice how the whole time he doesn't quip at all. No witty comebacks, no nicknames. He's just trying to appeal to Martin's humanity, insisting that he still has some good in him. We're happy to see that optimism pays off in Spider-Man 2 during Martin's redemption arc, complete with closure with Miles for killing his father. Not surprising, seeing as half the returning baddies in the sequel were redeemed. The other half, yikes. Ever 
Ever since PT, aka Silent Hills, the trend of corridor-based tension-building horror with scary visions that pile up more and more has taken the horror community by storm. It's mainly because Konami screwed the original game over, but it's also because the formula just works. Even some of the biggest horror games as of late took a page from PT and put their own spin on it, including Resident Evil. In Village, the second of the four lords you go after is Donna Beneviento, dollmaker and puppeteer of Angie. And, uh, the real best girl of Resident Evil Village? Who wrote this? As the shrinking violet of Miranda's children, Donna doesn't fight you head on. She prefers to take you down slowly and methodically. She starts off by luring Ethan into her mansion with illusions of Mia. Once he's in, she baits him with a flask of one of Rosa's parts before pulling it away, alongside all his firearms. I think hitting a defenseless child is my business. From here, you're left pretty much defenseless as you scour around the basement of the mansion and take apart the Jenga puzzle that is the Mia doll lying on the table. All the while, Mia's voice is ringing in your head and the stuff she says range from wholesome memories to ominous whispers. Eventually, you start hearing a baby crying. And as you return to where the doll is, you're greeted with this. I don't know what inner demons Ethan's got to conjure that out of his mind, but someone get this guy a priest. This thing is Donna's ace in the hole against Ethan's deteriorating psyche. Is it a physical abomination created by the mold or an illusion that kills him with a heart attack? Either way, this payoff is a surefire ticket to parental trauma. Once you finally escape that, Donna will try to stop you one last time by putting you through a game of hide and seek with Angie. You gotta find her across the mansion before the other dolls come in and gradually tear into you. All the while, you only hear ominous chanting in the background, followed by the laughter of those dolls getting louder the longer it takes you to find Angie. Once you stab the doll three times, the hallucination finally ends and Donna is dead. Illusion is Beneviento's bread and butter, gouging into Ethan's parental dilemma and monstrifying it. It's all fully rooted in how she goes about taking you down indirectly. Granted, I don't blame her for keeping her distance, considering you just gunned down this thing. What we got from it is a spectacular display of slow, suspenseful horror that made a mark as one of, if not, the scariest moment in any Resident Evil game. <laughs> Eggman and the Phantom Ruby Heavies from Sonic Mania. Great fight showing Eggman's descent into madness, but the illusory elements are too subtle, ironically. Rachel Ghoul, Batman Arkham City. Blood of the Demon is a hell of a drug. Zant, Twilight Princess. Unsure how much of this zany fight is an illusion. Does that give or take away points? I don't know. Roger Retton's Ace Attorney. Conceptually, you're dismantling a magic trick that confused other stage magicians. Gameplay-wise, it's just another case. I'm, I'm, I'm heading out of my mind. <sighs> Sorry about that, folks. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, reason number one why Okami is Josh's all time favorite game. No! Not even as a gag! You'll have to face the music when we reach the subscriber goal, dear! I have enough patience till then! Meep, meep. <clears throat> Moving on. I've talked countless times about the Arkham series, especially on these boss lists. There have been a lot of highs, plenty of lows. <laughs> Yeesh, maybe not that low. Anyway, if that intro gag or context didn't give it away, we're talking about Scarecrow from Arkham Asylum again. Just a recap for those out of the loop. Scarecrow, a sadistic scientist obsessed with spreading fear, is among the inmates on the loose throughout the asylum. Now and then we end up downwind of his patented fear gas. Every dosage drags the bat into intense hallucinations where he must face three of his worst fears. His fear of failure, being forced to relive the worst day of his life, 
and the horrifying possibility that he's no different from the psychopaths he protects Gotham from. The last one was so effective, I legit thought the game glitched. After each hallucination, the bat ends up trapped in Scarecrow's nightmare realm, where he is literally large and in charge. I'm the Boogeyman, and I'm coming to get you. To escape this literal nightmare, you have to sneak around the Titanic Scarecrow without being spotted, reach the spotlight, and force the dear doctor to, well, see the light. In the later nightmares, you also have to fight your way through masses of skeleton warriors. Thankfully, unlike the thugs in the real world, they don't get back up after you knock them out the first time. It may seem obvious to put these boss fights at number one, but can you blame me? The Scarecrow encounters in Asylum are arguably some of the trippiest in the whole series. And because we're in the driver's seat, we get to see firsthand how reality falls apart around the bat, trapping him in his worst fears and a hellish nightmare landscape. Yeah, after a while, you start to see the hints that nothing's as it seems, but they're still so subtle that they catch you off guard when they happen. Did anyone catch the game last night? <laughs> Oh yeah, one of my writers pointed out that Scarecrow's size reflects how much of a grip he has on his victim's psyche. And considering everything Batsy's endured in his life, it makes sense that his hallucinations are gonna hit extra hard. And it kinda makes sense having Scarecrow be the endgame baddie for Knight because when he weaponizes fear, life becomes an inescapable nightmare where you can't tell what's real and what's not. And the only thing worse than facing down a real life supervillain is not having control of your mind. I'm Josh Scorcher and- Dang it, honey! He's the fiery joker, and next time, it's personal. Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching. <laughs>